everybody! Welcome back to Houses and Hobbits. It's been a long time. We've uh, had our problems getting to this episode, but we're finally here. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping things really quick. This will be the last filmed episode of Houses and Hobbits. After this, it will be going to podcast oh. form. But that is okay because I have visuals for this episode today. So that's the main reason we're doing... Uh, yeah, so uh, one of the main reasons that it took so long to even get around to this episode was I did not have a this size map of the Lord of the Rings world. And unfortunately, when I made this order, I didn't realize I was supposed to pick the size. I already thought this was the size it would have been. So just bear in mind that that was my mistake. So my bad, guys. So for this episode today, we were just going to talk about the geography of each of the universes. Just go over it. Maybe go over just some of like where our main characters in each story ended up. And as of now, if you've been following along on our Game of Thrones perspectives, Alex has now seen all of Game of Thrones as well, so he is in the know. So, with that being said, let's go ahead and start with Game of Thrones so you don't have to hold up that map this whole time, Alex, for a little bit. Appreciate it. So, as you can see right here, we have the two main continents, which are Westeros and Essos. As I've talked about before in some of our uh, other parts of the world for Game of Thrones, we have somewhere down here Sothorios, and then there's another continent off way over in the east, mm -hmm. um, and it's called like Ulthos or something like that. Um, but the world is round, so there is plenty of the world that has not been explored in the Game of Thrones universe. Whoa. Now, the way that Westeros is set up, um, Martin has been very clear that it is meant to invoke England. England is kind of the main basis for it, and some of the monuments and landmarks that he takes, um, he actually kind of took from history, um, with the wall actually being Hadrian's Wall, which was a Roman fortification along the northern part, kind of dividing England from Scotland back in the day when they were, uh, when the Roman Empire was at its height. Sick. So that, uh, obviously it was not, uh, what I want to say, what, 700 feet high? Because that's what made the of ice. Yeah, it's not made of ice. Magical. It's just, yeah, no. <laughs> Nothing like that, but it is the basis of why he came up with the wall, which you can see is up here, uh, up above. Uh, this cuts off here, but the, the land of always winter up here is huge if you were actually to go a little bit further beyond. Um, you have the, the Starks are up here, mainly in the north which is, you know, a lot of our favorite characters. We care about the Honorable Starks. Yep. Um, but from Winterfell, they all kind of disperse into King's Landings all the way down here. Um, and with that, the Seven Kingdoms are actually the north. The Iron Islands, which you weren't sure exactly off the coast where it was, but it is down here. Yep. Uh, you, have the, um, you have the Vale here. The... The Kingdom of the Rock, which is the Lannister's Point, which right, is over Castle here. Rock. The Reach down here. Uh, Dorne, Alex, one of your hey, personal favorites. Love the desert. Uh, and then the Stormlands here. The only other things that are kind of odd, um, they consider the Riverlands its own kingdom at points, but it is the Seven Kingdoms, which we already named. But the Riverlands are just kind of in the middle. Uh, one of the big common things in the show is that when the kingdoms go to war, the Riverlands bleed because that seems to be always yeah. where all the battles end up happening. The midpoint for everybody. Midpoint for everybody. And then because of Aegon the Conqueror's conquest, you also have the Crownlands, which is just the area surrounding King's Landing. Yeah. So it's kind of its own province of the Seven Kingdoms. It does count as its own thing. Even when we played like Game of Thrones Risk together, yep. you noticed how the Crown Lands were kind of its own territory. Disputed. So, with that being said, let's go over to Essos really quick. So Daenerys, and, and this is something that like people don't understand why it's so obnoxious how long Daenerys... What a journey. Daenerys is in Essos for such a long time because you're talking about such a huge continent this way. And she starts off here in Pentos, which, you know, when her and her brother made their escape from King's Landing when she was a child, right, right, right. it was just right across the narrow sea to Pentos. Yep, from Dragonstone, and right? From Dragonstone, which is right here, just off the coast there. 
um, and that they begged off of people for a long time in the books, um, and eventually at the start of the actual show, um, she was living with Illyrio Mopatis, um, and then that's when she gets introduced to um, Cal Drago, and then they marry her off, and they that's start... Right. They start traveling, and that's when Daenerys's um, heck of a journey begins. Because you go from here, and the whole of season one, you're just traveling across Essos over here to the Dothraki Sea, which um, not a they, sea, in fact, a lot of land. <laughs> yeah, a lot of land. They don't like land. water. No, they huge. do not like water. Do not. not hands. <laughs> Um, and then actually, so just so you can follow here, Alex, mm -hmm. just to see here. So we go through the Dothraki Sea, and then Vice Dothrak, the yeah. capital or home tent of the Dothraki culture, mm. is all the way here. Right. So this is a huge journey here, which we, 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 we make fun of the amount of hopping around that people do in the later seasons of Game of Thrones. Yeah. But she made it all the way over here in one season. Which is insane. Which is insane. And actually, this is like the halfway point of the season. Right. And then from here, after the death of Viserys, by, you know... Who was complaining the whole... Who was complaining the entire way. My army's heading the wrong direction, and I can't blame him. You look at the distance that... He is going in the opposite direction yeah. of King's Landing, which right is his there. goal. Right there's King Landing. Oh, like, um, nope. You nope. kind of get why he's complaining, even though he's just terrible about he's it. He's the worst. Yeah. Um, but so he dies here at Vice Dothrak with the you know, epic golden crown. golden crown for King. Yeah. Uh, and then after that, Daenerys um, has convinced Khal Drogo to help her take the Iron Throne at some point. So with that... He leads them out of Ice Dothrak, and they start raiding all of these villages. So actually, they come down here to the area of the Lazine, or I, I'm pronouncing it wrong, I don't remember exactly, um, but that's where we meet Miri Mazdur, and all that stuff happens. And so it's most likely around this area that Khal Drogo succumbs to his wounds yep. for a time. Miri Mazdur heals him, which is obviously... Not worth anything. You see what life is worth there. So somewhere near the edge of the Red Waste Desert here is where the ceremony happens, where Daenerys gives... She burns Mary Mazdur, Khal Drogo, and the eggs. Mm. And that is what gives birth to her dragons through the miracle there. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, she is moving around through the Red Waste... Um, I'm trying to see where Karth is on this map. There it is. Okay. So, yeah, she moves through the Red Waste here. The, it's this whole thing where it's just looking yeah. hopeless for her and her no uh, Kalasar, as she calls them. And in the books, uh, they don't make a big deal of it in the show, but in the books, there is a ruin here, and I can't remember the exact name of it. Um, but it's where they stay, and then she sends out riders uh, sure north, south, east, and something. west to find something. You know, some bad stuff happens. One of her favorite riders gets killed, and his horse comes back with his head in the in the uh, basket. Well, and don't it's just go that like, way. Oh, so don't sad. Go that way. Um, eventually, but so one of them... eventually, one of them finds the city of Carth, which then they move this way down here, and certain maps I've seen, I, I liked this one the best just because it was the right size for this format, um, but certain maps have it a little bit different here for Karth, where it's kind of more over here, because you start getting this much further east, and you start getting into the Shadowlands, where a Shy is at, and all that good stuff, but for our purposes, we didn't go to a Shy, yeah. so we can just focus right here. Our story is <coughs> focused, you know, just, just general map, we'll have, like, little tidbits of other places, mm -hmm. but we'll never go there in no. the story. No, no. Um, and then from Karth, she stays there for a whole season, mm -hmm. and thankfully, uh, once she's done there, she gets a couple of traders, she gets, she, uh, takes... She basically just sacks the city and then takes ships, sails along down here past Old Geese, and eventually she comes to Astapor, which unfortunately does not show up here on the map, but it is in this area in Slaver's Bay. Mm. And then that's where Daenerys spends most of the rest of the series until she goes to Westeros because she just works her way up from Astapor after getting her unsullied. She conquers the city of Yunkai, and then she sets up camp 
in Mirin, which she kind of circled back yeah. from here. Sure did. Big circle around here. Yeah. Well, once you got the ships, right? Once you got those ships, obviously super easy to get yeah. up there. Um, and then she stays there for, I want to say, three seasons. She stays there for a very long, long time. time. Yep. Really just building up her army. Which, and also... which is fine. And obviously, um, the only, kind of the only um, side quest that she personally does is when she flies off on Drogon at the end of Season 5. Season 6 sees her back at Vice Dothrak, where she eventually becomes the leader of the entire Dothraki culture. Oh, yeah, that was a good uh, Brings time. them back to Marine. They help break the sea. She gets all of her thousand ships with the Greyjoys coming from the Iron Islands yeah. to help her. Um, and then that is what helps her travel all the way. And I assume that she, because most people do not sail through old Valyria because of what happened with Jorah and mm. other awful things that happen when you yeah. sail through that. And that's where the stone sickness is, right? So it's not relegated to just Valyria, but people who contract uh, grayscale do get sent to Valyria just gotcha. to live out their that's days. Like oh, exile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. basically. If you try to go through it's there. Just a, it's a giant leper colony down here at this point, ever since the, uh, the doom of Valyria. Yeah. Yeah. So she sails most likely around it, um, and then up through here, and then at the beginning of season seven, she lands at Dragonstone. Yeah. Great moment for her. Mm -hmm. um, Which is the farthest and this, Jon Snow actually goes uh, as far as getting to Essos. Dragonstone is the closest. Yep, from yeah, the north. That's yeah. as far so, as So yeah, Jon Snow, um, obviously at the beginning of the series, he goes Winterfell. from Winterfell to the Wall, and he's just screwing around back up to the here. Wall, back to Winterfell. Eventually, yep, he goes south, takes Winterfell back from the Boltons, and then yeah. he goes to Dragonstone, uh, he goes back north, fights yeah. White Walkers, gets in there, steals, steals a white from the White yeah. Walkers, and then goes Presents all the way it. to King's Landing, where yeah. Cersei had no interest of actually yeah. helping them. Yep. Except for the end of the series, where we have no idea where... Mm -hmm. um, uh, Williams's character goes, uh, uh, John's, uh, John's little sister. Uh, Maisie. Maisie. Maisie both uh, the characters. So you mean Arya, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Arya, besides where she goes at the very end of the series, yeah. this way. Because that's the whole thing is clearly, there's, there's only been it. stories, and I, I may have mentioned it in a previous episode, there have only been stories of whatever is west of Westeros, because like I said, Martin has stated that the world is round. Yep. So, so there, is, something's there is a way for you to go that way to get over here mm. but most of the stories that i've read or just other things about that mm. most people who have gone that way never return or perish uh because from what i understand the far west the far west the weather and the storms and the seas are just some of the worst traveling you could ever do yep. well also and if so, he's basing it off of europe mm -hmm. and we're supposed to assume that you go past europe yep. and go farther west you would end up in like north america exactly where we're at right. that's a large gap of sea mm -hmm. where no one's been able to travel that far even the great Which is so it, it's right. so interesting to me on that aspect because by our own, now that we know what our world looks like, obviously the Pacific Ocean is the one that's the real big one. Yep. And so it almost feels like for this to be basically Europe, England, uh, you would hope that the seas were a little bit closer yeah. for whatever's this way, but it almost seems like it's just this huge swath. Yeah, it actually I, and I, I do, kind of represents the UK a little bit. I do find it interesting that, like I said, he just kind of makes this a mishmash of English um, culture, basically. Yeah. Um, and then over here, you get a lot more Asian, like, well, especially far, far east. You yeah. have the Kingdom of Yi Ti. Yeah, it seems like African and Asian cultures combined. Kind of combined. Yeah. Dora a little continent. bit, too, with the Arabic and, and the Middle Eastern. Kind yeah, of I was going to say a little bit of that, but also some of that uh, Hispanic yeah, for sure. influence as well. So yep. it's a, it, Pedro it, Pascal. Pedro you know. Pascal. Um, but other than that, that's just kind of a basic gist of all of that. I don't really want to go into everybody's individual travels on this because you could just be going in circles around Westeros all day. Yep. Daenerys is at least the most straightforward where you can see the amount of distance she covers throughout the series in a very clear line. Mm -hmm. um, and is King's Landing technically a part of, um, like, the... 
Storm like I said, the Crownlands is basically its, it's own little right. province. Was it ever some, like one of these um, before? It like, was. It was most likely just disputed land between the kingdoms of the Vale, the West, the Reach, and uh, gotcha. the Stormlands. So it's never really been properly. Owned it was never properly owned. Obviously, when they were because before Aegon even came, right. these were all disputing kingdoms, constantly fighting with each other. It was only under the threat of a conqueror coming to unite them all into seven kingdoms that then the kingdom of the Reach and the Rock both came together to try and stand against Aegon and that leads to the Field of Fire incident. Right. So Yeah, more going on there. But no, that's a bit there and I I like in the show the way um they portray a lot of these different areas. We don't get to see much of the Westerlands, but when you go to like the Bloody Gate and the Eerie and all that stuff, the yeah. giant mountains, and, and you feel that from the books, especially the way it's described, the hike up to the Eerie in the books is so much crazier than yeah. they even describe it. It's in almost the like show. a climb up to Mount Everest. Like, it's like a Truly, crazy no, journey. There are many times in the um, first book where Catelyn is just talking about like you have to take you have to go to different base camps along your way up and the air is definitely getting thinner not quite to that death zone that you have like on actual Mount Everest right. yeah. but it's still a high up fortress and obviously that's why it, yeah. it's never been conquered by anybody besides Aegon because he had dragons mm. just flew up there just flew up there and just said hey you don't join me I'm maybe, maybe your kid takes a tumble. That's literally, <laughs> that's literally what happened. Is uh, his sister flew up on the dragon here in the mountains, and uh, the little son of the uh, king or queen at the time um, was super interested in the dragons, and so she took him for a ride. And then she just kind of was like, "Would would be a shame for something to happen to him, so you better uh, join us." Yep. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that that's a really cool thing. Um, I'm trying to think any other... Littlefinger's name? Littlefinger's? I was going to say, so Littlefinger, most of you who know the character of Peter Baelish, he was born mm -hmm. in this area here in the Fingers, that's why they call him that, um, for maybe, that's hopefully the only reason they call yeah, him that. Yeah, I think mean, it is. Um, Iron Bank. Iron Bank is actually going to be up here in Bravo. So, yes, Bravo. So we didn't focus on them a lot, but the free cities, if you if we've talked about those, are kind of all scattered around this area. Once you start getting this way, Dothraki attacks are much more likely. So you just have to make sure you're prepared for that. But uh, Bravos is up here, and it's kind of that swamp landy. The old gladiator. Oh yeah, gosh, yeah, the Titan of Bravos. So, yeah. but yeah, it was basically a hidden marshland that. The freed slaves of Valyria went after its settled. destruction. At, no, actually, er, it was before its destruction. Oh, that's right. They all they all rebelled, right? Um, because at one point, when Bravos made itself known to the world, it was trading with mm -hmm. the freehold of Valyria until the Doom. Which some speculation, maybe the faceless men who were now part of Bravos, right. might have caused that. There might have been, you know, some witchcraft going on that brought about their own destruction. It might have been a natural disaster where all the yeah. volcanoes blew up. Nobody insane. actually knows this, and maybe Martin will cover that. If he ever actually finishes the, the normal books, that'd be fine. I believe they're actually, they wanted to make a series on... Oh. I mean, we're doing House of the Dread, right? Yeah, yeah which we, that's going to be focusing on... Um, their move the towards the So... I think it'll be after Aegon's rule. It'll be after Aegon's rule. Um, I mean, I it'll, it'll definitely deal with, I think, the Blackfire Rebellions, which we haven't talked about much on the show, but um, can definitely get into yeah. it in later episodes if we so desire. And then Valeria, was it ever connected? And yeah, no, so it, you, it used to all be one big peninsula off the bottom of Essos, and then whatever happened whether it was a meteorite or Rainos, volcanoes, magic, whatever, whatever, the whole th the whole peninsula was just shattered. And that is basically what it was. So parts of it sank into the sea. Um, just all this horrible stuff happened there. And we don't even know. One of all the greatest it. mysteries yeah. of this world. And it's literally like all of a sudden, it, it was like Rome. Mm -hmm. It was like Rome all of a sudden just disappeared. One of the greatest civilizations just yeah. was gone. In the, uh, like all, Pompeii, really. All, yep. Yeah, perfect. Pompeii, perfect example. Perfect example. Um, but yeah. Let me see. Any other noteworthy things that you want to point out, guys? Anything that you feel I missed on 
locations that you want to talk about? I think you covered most of it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I do. Just, I, I, just just so I can stab you in the heart a little bit. Your boy died right here. Your boy, your boy Rob Stark died uh, at the twins. I know. Spoiler. I know. And yeah, the, and the important, and you can't see this probably, but that river there, the reason that it's so hard to, to cross. So yeah, that, the twins, that right? is the river Trident. And that, you know, you and... can't move an entire army with that all in the way. <laughs> so the, that twins, you, if you want to enter and get anywhere near anything in the south, that's, that's yeah. So, and this is just speculation on my part, just based on what I know of the history um, when you had Robert's Rebellion, mm. the whole thing with him fighting Rhaegar Targaryen, right. I believe it happened here in this area of the Trident. Right. And, and there's the whole story about, you know, Rhaegar's encrusted with his ruby-encrusted armor, yeah. and, you know, Robert Baratheon's got the his war hammer, and he just <laughs> caves in his breastplate, all that it. stuff. Yeah. Um, and it's funny, because I, I believe both in the show and the books, you have this fun scene where... Arya on their way down from Winterfell to King's Landing. They're like, oh, let's go hunt it. Let's go uh, hunt for rubies in the Trident. Maybe some of Rhaegar's rubies are still there. So yeah. was, that's, that's funny. Great little tidbits. Like, yeah. Little tidbits of like, ah, oh, backstory yeah. while you're in different locations. And shout out Bear Island up here. Uh, good old Bear Island, Leon yeah. Mormont, Jor Mormont. Yeah. Good old... Excited for uh, uh, Liana and um, <laughs> Martell to be in Last of Us. Just a little snippet. Oh, yeah, that's right. I'm really excited. Yeah, the uh, actress for uh, Liana Mormont, uh, she will be playing Ellie, if I recall, right? Yep. Yeah. But I'm actually excited for that. Good yeah. for her. Pedro Pascal, Joel. It's going to be cool. But, uh, yeah, no, Pedro song. Pascal, man, he's just doing good. He's killing it. Yeah, he's rocking the game. But, man. Um, let me see. Uh, any other last-minute things I want to... Cover on that. Oh, how about the uh, the the um, the Tower of Love? Where's, uh, oh, where's that? Oh, so the located? Tower of Joy. Yeah. For those of you, R plus L equals J. Obviously confirmed by the show. Um, seemingly, seemingly <laughs> confirmed by the show. Um, the so that was the thing. So one of the people who were loyal to the crown um, when Robert's Rebellion happened was Dorne. And so, with that being said, the Tower of Joy was somewhere in the mountains here, and I actually want to see some maps. It's it's on there. Uh, it is not on there, but it is in the mountains right here in the north of Dorne. Mm -hmm. So when Ned Stark is um, riding to go and see where his daughter, I mean, uh, sorry, his sister is, mm -hmm. Lyanna, um, he had actually just come from King's Landing, where the city had just been sacked, um, the whole thing with Gregor Clegane um, killing Elia Martell and all the other awful Terrible things, things I'm not going to say yep. right now for demonetization's sake. <laughs> um, but he hey, came all the way down here. Um, in the show, I believe it was five men. Uh, in the books, it was seven men. Yes. Uh, so I want to say it was five against two in the show. And then seven against three Kingsguard in the books, right, right. which I prefer the book scene. Well, the greatest Kingsguard. Yeah, were the represented there. yeah. I prefer the book scene just a little bit more when it's depicted. But Arthur Dane, right? Uh, Arthur Dane Arthur was one Dane. of them. Um, Gerald, Sword of the Sword of the Morning, of the morning yeah. and Gerald Hightower yes. was, I believe, the Lord Commander. Or I epic. could be wrong on that. Don't don't scare me. Epic that. epic scene. Epic scene. Regardless book or, or um, show. Oh, and then just another couple of little legend points. Um, at one point, it is speculated that uh, Essos and Rest Westeros were connected here. Yep. Um, when the Roinar, which were the people who lived on the River Roin, uh, some uh, some of them who sailed with Nymeria, some people. Um, crossed over into that, and their water god was said to have broken mm. that, as well as um, when the children of the forest were basically the ruling power on Westeros, right. um, they eventually were fleeing north from the first men, and they may have flooded, which the Neck is a marshy area. At some point, they may have flooded this area to try and break off the north, as we know it, mm. off from the rest of Westeros to kind of keep the first men from yeah. destroying any more of their weirwood trees, all that good House stuff. House Reed is somewhere in that. House there. Reed is somewhere, the somewhere in that area. Because Moat Kalen is the lowest point, and then, right, right, right. And then somewhere in here is where the crown of men reside. And that's, and that's an interesting point, too, because the Iron Islands, you wonder how, you know, they came in and got Mo Kalen, well, they just used... Yeah, I was going to say super, there. super easy. Um, Being one of the only, like, naval 
force and so, drop. Yeah, let, let me let me talk about Theon's journey really quick in season two. So obviously they take Moat Kaelin like I would believe it was Yara and yeah. the rest of the Ironborn. He was just given you know a, sh- a ship to go and just raid along the stony shore here. But then his trick that he plays to get Winterfell is he moves inland, takes Torren Square right here, which you know is. Right close to Winterfell. A little bit away from Winterfell. And that's where he lures out um, the Master at Arms. I'm I'm forgetting his name right now. But he goes out to go and help Torrent Square. And that's when Theon, with his 20 or so men, scales Winterfell and takes it over. Um, Yeah. Tacticians, those Iron Islanders. Kind of have to be. No, and how small they do. And how small their provinces. And obviously, it kind of helps. Yeah, I was going to say. They do not sow. that, that is the worst part. So obviously with the Iron Islands, they don't have the the land that the Reach does. So why would they ever sow? They have to they have the to raiding. live off of reaping raiding. and raiding. Yeah. So, um, Very cool. Shivering Sea, also a large area. We talked about ice dragons in one of our creatures right. things. Just speculative stuff where as you get further north in the Shivering Sea, you have these massive clouds of just pure ice with possible ice dragons in them that are said to freeze ships with their icy breath. Yeah, and it's supposed to be kind of like based on like Antarctica where it's just like yep. a large body of ice. Yep. Quick question, Bruce. Yes, how, how many years across the eight seasons does Game of Thrones take place? So across the eight seasons, I'm just going to speculate... Less than ten. It's less than ten um, because... Ari is a really good way to base the age. Yeah. Because Ari is the only one that you actually see developing growth. I want to say it's about seven years. Seven years. Yeah, I can't imagine more than seven. How long are the three? In the In the books, however, you're talking about maybe four years, maybe less. At this point, at this four point. years, yeah. So remember, the show actually branched right. off from the book's timeline. Yeah. So the show really sped things well, up. Well, and that's the other thing. So the show had to age up its characters because it couldn't really have 13-year-old Daenerys right. having sex with Khal Drogo. Yeah. So, so they believe, really changed so it So I believe explicit. she was 16, um, and I think most people gained about three years when it came to the so show. Saying, so saying seven years for Game of Thrones, how many years over the course of, uh, of the uh, Lord of the Rings films? How many years so there? with that, well, let's go ahead and switch over to that if you want to bring up the map. Well, I want to bring up that. an interesting question because I want the viewers maybe to answer before that we actually get to an answer. So whose journey was longer, Frodo's or Daenerys? Daenerys. Yeah, Daenerys by far. By Frodo's far. journey was thirteen super months. Literally in the the ending of Return of the King, Frodo's whole narration is thirteen months to the day since Gandalf sent us on our long journey. We were home back in the Shire. But not so much time, but like distance. So that's the thing. That's the question. That is the thing because of these worlds are so different and also they don't necessarily have units of measurement. That's why it's a good um, question. It, it's a great question um, because one of the things, especially once we got into the later seasons of Game of Thrones, you had so many people just kind of going places which they needed to wrap mm-hmm. up the story. I forgive them a little bit, yeah. but there were those little bits and pieces. They were traveling where, incredible distances in yeah, a short amount of time, which uh, didn't make sense. Like when you get to the Beyond the Wall episode in season seven where Daenerys is coming from here... In what seems like a day, all the way up here, and even s- with dragons, it's like that's insane. That's, that's insane. an insane distance to cover. So, so the unit of travel is just completely off the map. Yeah. Who's so, faster, a falcon in uh, Lord of the Rings or a dragon? Yeah, are you mean an eagle? Eagle. Okay. Probably the eagles. I mean, well, that's the other thing. So, like, looking at the These Lord of the Rings, questions. they don't really have bodies of water that they're traveling all the no. time. Yeah. So it's harder to judge distance. Because in this, we can kind of tell, we can like, okay, taking a ship from Essos all the way to Westeros takes blank amount of time. We don't have that and, option and, Well, here. And that's the thing, is so when, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, internet or anybody here, I feel like whenever I've watched Lord of the Rings versus Game of Thrones, they don't ever talk about the distance, they just talk about the time. They just talk about time. They exactly. just talk about time. And that's why it gets so It'll, frustrating when you get to the end of the season, yeah. and they're moving like without Whereas I remember sometimes where like Gandalf was like talking as they left Rivendell, um... It'll be like this many leagues to the Gap of Rohan, and then we'll blah, blah, blah to, you know, Mordor or whatever yeah. the heck. The other issue when you're trying to determine length is in Game of Thrones, you have different provinces and different, like, mm-hmm. continents with completely different climates. Yeah. You've got deserts, you've got 
um, <laughs> coastal towns. Marshes, you've got towns. marshes. You've got Frozen. Iceland areas. Yeah. Lord of the Rings. It's all very similar. Like there's some differences. Yeah, but it's very like, obviously, similar. Like the Shire looks. Yeah. The way it does, but then you kind of get outside of the Shire, and obviously, not to knock New Zealand, uh, everything. But it all looks like New Zealand. It, but yeah, it, it all looks kind of the same on the. Just like the plains areas, I will give Fellowship this in the beginning. As you left the Shire, there was a lot of different, a lot of different landscape yep. until you got to Rivendell, and then once we headed out from Rivendell, things kind of got similar, samey. Yeah, but well, I mean, you you have like animals and things that you know go to a certain climate, mm-hmm. like the elephants, the giant elephants mm-hmm. from the well, man. What book was uh, uh, well, it? was the end of the book, but. What movie you, was it? No, it's Return of the King. Okay, right. so in Return of the King, you so have like elephants. The elephants are from this desert area. Exactly. Now. So you know there is a desert, you Jesus just don't towers, see it. Jesus. Yes, you do. You do yeah. see them in the two towers. Yeah, you just don't see them, though. So it's like, where Game of Thrones does a great job of, like, diversing their continents. Well, and to be fair, Middle-earth, is that a, is that a continent, or...? So it that's is. the thing. So Middle-earth so, is a so continent. Yeah, let, so, yeah, are... with that, let's switch over to yeah. Lord of the Rings now. And for the viewers at home, we will do some editing for this, so you can see the map a little bit better. It's very nice when you're looking up close, but, um, yeah, no. We'll, we'll <laughs> Size have, is a little we'll, we'll, we'll have to do a couple of uh, editing things for you at home. But, so with, um, and this is just, I wanted just to do Middle Earth. I wasn't going to do any of the speculative maps of the it's rest all speculation. of the world. Because, so we've, I've talked about this on our, um, I believe on the Religions episode of how um, Middle Earth, or Arda, is the whole world, mm. is actually flat. Mm. So, with that being said, though, this is actually a really small chunk of the world. Mm. The, uh, the whole continent actually is quite big. You have the giant sundering sea that splits um, Middle Earth away from the Undying Lands. I forget the actual name of the continent for that, but that's Red Earth. No, no. (laughs) (laughs) So, but you have Middle Earth right here, and there is a whole bunch more that goes off into uh, North and um, South and uh, East. So yeah. No, nothing west. Like I said, oh, that's that. Besides the right. undying lands, it's but. hard when it's a flat because then you don't have like you can't yeah. go over here. To and it, over here. and I I think it was more like a flat plate, so it's like a flat it circle. Looked, the way they from described I, it is it's from supposed to be a flat I, circle. Yeah, from what I saw it's, in my research for yeah. it. Mm. Correct me again if I'm wrong. So again, so like you were talking about how Frodo's whole journey takes place over 13 months. Mm-hmm. Do you want to show where the so, like, yeah. journey starts and ends? So, and we'll probably do some zoom-ins on this uh, for later. Um, but so he starts here in the Shire. And if, Alex, if you want to just like... No, 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 no. Like, if you want to look where I'm pointing at on the map. So, so he starts up here in the Shire. Hobbiton is where he lives. They eventually leave, go to Bywater, uh, Buckland, and there's Bree. So they go through here. Um, the Brandywine River is somewhere in here. That's where you have that chase scene with the Nazgul where they have to run to the little yep. raft. And really speeds up that journey. Really speeds up that journey when they're being chased, which, you know, it's helpful. Get some Randell quick. Uh, they stop in Bree, and that's where they uh, meet Strider, Aragorn. Mm-hmm. Um, and from Bree, they go to Weathertop, which was the fortress that um, kept peace between three kingdoms of Arnor when it split up after the king, like mm. the line had failed, basically. Um, that's where Frodo gets stabbed. And then from there, it is just a breakneck pace for him because they need to get him to Elrond before the Morgul Blade infected his heart. Yep. Um, so Arwen comes, or Glorfindel in the books. Um, and she takes him to Rivendell as quick as she can once they cross the river that is around Rivendell. Obviously, she can protect him. Elrond's magic um, is able to stop the Nazgul from crossing. Um, and then they stick around there for a little bit. Once the Fellowship is formed, they start their trek south with the intention of getting to the Gap of Rohan here and moving east from there. But Gimli had a great idea. Well, no, and it wasn't even Gimli. Like, yes, he had a great idea because he was like, let's, let's go through the Mines of Moria. Oh, we're but a but, but what finally like pushes them towards that option mm. is so as they're traveling south, Saruman's sending all of his crows out as his spies, and yep. you know he's he's watching the Gap of Rohan at this point. He is completely betrayed. 
the allies. And they um, know for a fact that they're, if they keep protruding south, he will, he's going to know. They're just going to be able to cut him off. Mm. Yep. So that's where the idea to go through the mines goes. So, and, and, well, so they, then they want to go over the mountain, so they go over the mountain, and that uh, Caradress was the pass that they went through, and that's yeah. the whole... They were just a really tough time. The, and well, it's, a, it's whole, an impossible yeah, pass. Yeah, because Saruman's then also sending storms their way, and yeah. they're freezing the hobbits, and you know, oh, it's just a horrible thing. And so that's where Frodo, because Gandalf gives it, and he puts it in Frodo's yeah. hands, let the ring bearer decide. Is there any particular reason that uh, Gandalf's magic wasn't great enough to at least at neutralize? That point, so remember when we were talking about the tiers of, of power? You've got well, Sauron so with, way at the top. Yeah, I was going to say, so S Sauron... Um, great eye. He's not the top top, but Sauron's no. pretty high up there. Gandalf is... He's just a little bit below he's Sauron. Lower than so it's not like Gandalf can... Can completely but, but, counter. But so we're talking about Sauron, though. Sauron. Yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry, Sauron. No, yeah. no, you're good. Because he said um, Because with the five wizards, you have the, you do have a hierarchy there. And with Saruman being the white and being like he was the greatest of his order at the time, Gandalf was just, you know, a gray. Sec he was second fiddle. Like, and they and they all have their different colors. The two blue wizards, which the two we blue won't wizards, get into. We they... There's There's too much don't worry about it for now. No, we literally hardly know anything about them. Radagast is the Radagast, only one. Radagast, nature only, boy. Yeah. He's the only one who gets touched upon in the Hobbit movies, um, as well as a little bit in the books, but hardly any of that. Right. So, 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 but, but, sorry, but, but Gandalf the, didn't have the power to Yeah, counter. exactly. At that time, he just wasn't, he wasn't at the level yet. And then, obviously, he comes back, and then he is the new... Right. White so wizard. So Frodo decides to Gimli's go, got a great to go idea. through the Mines of Moria, which is under this section of the Misty Mountains. Right and to, there. to be fair, the dwarf thought that his nope, civilization yeah, was, was still down great there. Great idea. Really which, sad, but really good. Dick move by Gandalf. Not to tell for him. For not telling him, because Gandalf knew. Yeah, 100% he knew. Because the, there's this whole narration where when Frodo decides or like when uh, he's he's thinking over should we go through the mines and there's this whole narration where Saruman's just like you know what's in there you know that the d dwarves dug too deep and too greedily and they found yeah and zooms on Gandalf who's looking like yeah like oh god mad no. sus yeah, yeah mad like, sus <laughs> but at the same time Gandalf is supposed to be the same power level as what they dug up right which is yep. for, remind me it's a Balrog a Balrog, Balrog. so ba Gandalf and the Balrog, they, he knows that he can probably hold him off. So he's not thinking he's it's just, just... He just wants to make sure he takes the safest exactly. route to make sure yeah. that their journey goes... Which is ultimately goes why he said to make the decision. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, but I think for Gandalf's mindset, like granted it was a dick move for not letting Gimli know. Gimli know. know. But, but they I think, wouldn't have gone if he let him know. No, right? less the thing, though. Like, like, I, think, I think Gandalf was, was thinking about it in terms of, okay, well, I know I can probably take... Fighting the Balrog. the Balrog, I know I cannot. If we go farther south, he can't do Sauron, and he can't do Sauron. Exactly, but he can fight a Balrog. So worse comes to worse. I think in his mind, he was like, okay, let Frodo decide. I can kind of work yeah. around we'll, whatever we'll option. We'll and yeah. just looking at the map, Rick, is there any other option besides the Mines well, of so Moria? That's Unless they call it these when, I, when I was a kid, I didn't <laughs> <Right>. under <laughs> when I was a kid, I didn't understand why they didn't just go all the way south. I never realized that these mountains here, the White Mountains, were fully connected all the way to the coast here. Yep. I I always thought that they should have just kept going further south and just gone through Gondor. But I didn't realize that there was a mountain range. Yeah, that it's, it's would almost stop like them. the White Wall in basically, Game of Thrones. Right? It just it completely so cuts they off. They basically only had three options. And anybody who tells me about the eagle argument, no, just no. Not for this discussion. Not for this discussion. <laughs> um, would have been real helpful though. <laughs> would have been helpful, but <laughs> there's can't even but there is the chance that the eagles could have been corrupted by the power yeah. of the ring. So that's the other reason we yeah. can't do that. Which if Gandalf can, Gandalf can even be corrupted by it, like. Yeah. No, Wait, you saw how Gandalf reacted in yep. Fellowship when he, he's like, "Take it, Gandalf, take it. Don't tempt me." Like, yeah, he knew if he the took hobbits. That. Hobbits were the best option for who should have the ring mm -hmm. because they are diminutive. They don't have any ambitions. They like, they're simple good. folk. They're yeah, they're simple they're, folk. They're simple folk. They I don't. Know <laughs> 
Idahoans as our <laughs> cameraman camera would like to say. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we go through the mines of Moria. We go through the mines of Moria. We lose so with that one, we uh, we were, for time wise, we were in Moria for about three to five days. I can't remember exactly. Yeah, but wow. it they, it was a long trek. Obviously, you're. It, it would have been the same time. To go down south. Yeah, just thinking of the movies, that's actually yeah. It goes very. It's fast. a de- it, it, obviously it goes fast. It's a movie. They try to speed it. Right. Yeah. Um. Because I want to say they were at that. You know that um, part where Gandalf's like, I don't have any memory of this place, and it was like the three different staircases, and he's trying to figure out which, which way they're supposed to go. to go. I think they spent about a day at that. Yeah, Gandalf spent like a long time deciding yeah. which route because because depending yeah. on which route he chose, it would have ended up completely different sections of the mountain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he really needed to decide and, like where where should we go. And obviously one of those staircases when we see later when it starts lighting up after uh, Pippin throws a skeleton down a well <laughs> Thank God they didn't choose like the far left one, if I recall. That would have been instant. <laughs> like all the goblins were down right. there. Right, right, right. Um, Which is interesting. So Gimli didn't realize. Gimli had no idea like, that any of like, this was happening. He thought that his dwarven people, one of his, uh, like, but like he, in the three to five days, like he, obviously they open, they get into Moria. There's he no other. He, he knew something, something was, wrong. was wrong because so when they first entered. Um, they go through the, the, the door with the riddle on yep. it, whatever, and it's like, oh, they call it a mine, and Boromir's like, oh, this is no mine, it's a tomb, because you see all the dead goblins and dwarves yep. just scattered around the entrance hall. Mm. So typically the entrance hall would have been guarded by dwarves, right. so Gimli kind of knew right off the get-go, he was like, Something okay, was this wrong, is kind of like, hey, maybe they're in hiding right now, kind of it's but it wasn't until they got to Balin's tomb right. and, like, got the written record of, like, what happened that Gimli's like... Okay, all the rest of them are dead. I yeah, know, Gimli, I'm the only dwarf left in Moria right now. Gimli needed proof. Yeah. So, it's tough. So, but anyway, so they make it out. So they make it out of Moria. Thanks to uh, Gandalf's uh, sacrifice. Thanks to Gandalf's sacrifice. Right. And, um, and it doesn't really show it right here, but um, there are, are those hill lands that they were in right at the edge where they needed to get to Lothlorien as quickly as possible so the goblins could not pursue them. Yep. But thankfully, Lorien is literally just like right down the mountain from them, but they needed to get there within the day, otherwise they could have been hunted. And again, that, that's a little bit more touched upon on the books yeah. than the, the show. The show, yeah. the movie really just... No, and, there. Oh, and right. when you have about, what? Six uh, hours total, seven hours total. No, it's... Uh, I'm, I'm doing the math really quick. I want to say about 10 to 11 hours. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, they did a good job of still making the world feel big while still trimming out some of the fat. Yeah. Um, and then they stay in Lorien for a couple of days, recoup, and get their bearings together after losing such a valuable companion. And then the elves of Lothorian give them their gifts, all that stuff. They start heading down the river Anduin um, to the falls of Raros, which is where the uh, big statues of Elendil and um, Isildur are. Yes. And that is here at this little lake that has the that's where uh, we lose our second fellowship. that's where we lose our second fellowship member well, and, and two more but not dead right well yes we lose but, them for the journey yeah. but we don't lose them permanently no. yeah not we, like Boromir. we lose Boromir at the Falls of Raros sorry Shane, um, and the rest of the uh, fellowship starts to splinter um, Frodo starts heading east across the river with Wa- Sam with, with Sam with Sam <laughs> and uh, Aragorn Legolas and Gimli begin their trek to go and find Merry and Pippin yep. who have been taken west to Isengard because the Uruks were tasked with taking the hobbits who they thought had the ring to Saruman yep. and again remind me why they chose to go after those two was it just a loyalty thing All they, well, so, so the thing was if you remember in the movie uh, at that point, Frodo was having a really hard time trusting anybody. Boromir had already shown oh, yeah. he was being corrupted. Yeah, he felt that. Um, and at he one, felt, well, obviously, he sacrificed and, and, himself. And his whole vision with um, Galadriel yeah. was that all of the members of the Fellowship right. would turn on him if he had the ring in his possession. So at this point, he knows he must make the journey alone. Thank God he didn't do it alone. Otherwise, it would have failed because Sam is beast mode. Oh yeah, I meant um, why does Legolas, Gimli, and Aragorn go after Pippin? Uh, they're they're part of the like fellowship. A, well, like I said, because rather than the be- ring bearers, what I mean. well, no, no, because no, no, Frodo, the Frodo wanted Frodo basically told him told get away. Aragorn, <laughs> and like that's the whole thing is Aragorn is living with this burden of my ancestor failed to destroy this thing. And so now, mm-hmm. if I were to fall victim to it, I just, I can't have that happen. 
So he lives with that weight on his heart. So he eventually just, he lets Frodo go and he says, you need to do this on your own. I would have followed you to the end, mm. but right. you need to do what's best for every one of us. And again, with Frodo not trusting anybody, it would have made the journey almost impossible. Right. Because Frodo would constantly be like looking over like, his shoulders. Like, thank God it's only Sam and uh, Smeagol that he has to look out for once he gets to Em and Yule. Um, but so at that point, Gimli, Legolas, and Aragorn, th they're a little bit upset, like, oh man, the fellowship's broken, but like, let's go save Merry and Pippin, because at least there's still a chance for them, and then that leads into this whole shenanigan, so they split up here. Let's follow them. Frodo and Sam for So a let's bit. go with Frodo and Sam, they go into the hills of Emmanuel, that's where they are, f and they've been followed by Smeagol this whole time, mm -hmm. he was in Moria, following after them he was he was actually um in an extended scene in the fellowship he was on a log following behind them on their boats it's, it's funny and he keeps on trying to act like he's not there and moving his hands in a way mm, hope they don't see me stage, but yeah. but even aragon's just like yeah, he's following us man yeah, they um, so they him. they meet up with him and they basically make him part of their little mini fellowship um, and he leads them through the Dead Marshes with the express goal of getting to the Black Gates here at the northern part of Mordor. Um, but that is also the most heavily guarded entrance in Middle-earth at that point. Yeah, and a lot of people thought from the get-go that was Schmeagol trying to screw oh, him over. Yeah, right. No, no, no. That was, that was Frodo and Sam's goal. Oh, Literally, well. that was their goal. Yeah, um, so but like Schmeagol knew what was there though. Schmeagol yeah. had seen, he had known, like if they went that route. Yeah, and so. Well, didn't they ask him, like, take us there? Yeah, and so he was yeah, like, that's yeah. the thing. Yeah, yeah, he said, he yeah, said yeah. lead us to the Black Gate. And then once they're there, inside of it, he he stops them from going because they, they were about to make a jump for it because you had the Easterlings coming yeah. into the gate. Um, and he stops them and he just said, there's another way, I know another way. Yeah. Let's go. And like, why didn't you mention it before? Master didn't ask. Mm -hmm. So it's like, and at this point, he's not act, he's not actively trying to screw them over. Yeah. Because if they get killed, the ring's yet. gone from well, there. Exactly. Yeah. So he's, he, he's still neutral at this point. He's right? still kind of in that, you know, the, the Gollum side of him absolutely wants it, but the Smeagol side of him is growing attached to Frodo in ways. Right. Um, because Frodo at least shows him kindness. Um, so from there, they head south along the way. Um, eventually in the forest of Ithilien down here, they are picked up by Faramir after they see the Oliphant. Um, Boy, his brother. Yep. Uh, he takes them to Osgiliath, which is the little ruined city right here in the middle of the river, uh, just closest to Minas Tirith. Um, through that... Um, they run away from him. No, no, no. So he lets them go. That's yeah. right. Because he was going to take them to his father, which thank God he didn't. He finally, you know, gets to a point where he's going to be a nice guy yeah. and let Frodo go. And so they go. Um, he is aware, however, of the danger that waits in the secret pass that Gollum is leading Frodo and Sam towards. Um, I believe that's the spider, yeah, right? Yeah, it was the spider, Shelob. 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 Um, but so after that, and at this point, um, Gollum had been the, beaten up pretty bad by, uh, Faramir and he was blaming the hobbits for it. Yeah. Um, so he is now scheming now, to get them killed by the spider. And so this is when Schmeagol gets less in control. Gollum starts to take yeah. over. Yeah. So they pass through those forests there. And as you get closer to Mordor, obviously the landscape starts to change a little bit. It's a lot more being destroyed by the evil that is there, whether that just be the storms that are constantly coming through Mordor, whether it be just the orcs that are just chopping down trees to fuel their engines of war, all that. And it just looks more rocky. Yeah. Good so, times so far, in Good times yeah. in... But you start, you start the story with the foresty kind of wilderness area. Yeah. Then you go to, like, the plains... And now you're in the, the mountain pass, yeah. rocky area. Yeah. They have quite a climb up this. Yeah, so oh, they, yeah. Get, they get to Minas Morgul, which is was once... Which, by the way, sick-looking, horrific tower. Oh, absolutely. Like, it whoa. was once a city of Gondor built against the mountains there. Eventually it was taken so over. So evil-looking. <laughs> um, and then they climb up the secret stairs to Shelob's uh, lair. Um, and that's where... 
Gollum basically plays his hand to Frodo, where now Frodo now knows that he is trying to take the ring yep. away from him. Sam, thankfully, notices the Lembus bread that has been thrown on the stairs and realizes the trickery that was going on to get rid of him. So he goes and he saves Frodo. Um, he presumes a little too late, as Frodo has been stabbed by Sheila with her venom, um, but then thankfully some exp expositing orcs let Sam know that Frodo's not dead. Yeah. So thank God Sam uh, goes and saves Frodo. He could have finished the journey on his own. because He really could have. He already took the ring from Frodo at that point, but thank God he didn't. Um, could have could have been difficult. Because once they get out of... Uh, so you have Minas Morgul at the bottom, and then you have Tirith Ungol... Um, at the top, which was another watchtower of Gondor, just yeah. kind of keep an eye on Mordor, but it was like right there, yeah. so eventually Mordor just took it from them. Um, and then they get stuck with a group of orcs that are heading up to the Black Gate to meet Aragorn. We'll get to their the rest of their journey in a bit, um, but thankfully they are able to outwit some of the orcs, and then they head south back to Mount Doom. Um, and that is where their journey ends for the destruction of the ring. And then they just go back Still to the Minas. birds take them. The birds take the them way. to Minas Tirith. We have Aragorn's whole coronation, and then they head home to the Shire. I don't know the exact route that they took, but probably on birds. No, no. <laughs> well, they end up in the Elven area. No, on their way back, right? Nope. Uh, they might have stopped there, but uh, the scene the, the, the scene where Frodo wakes up is in Minas Tirith. Gotcha, okay. Because literally, like, the next scene is where... Do you remember that, is that place, too? Mm -hmm. I remember that as Rivendell, yeah. but it's not. No, it looks like Rivendell. It looks but, just like it. But yeah. in the next scene, it's Aragorn's coronation. And it's described, it's described a lot differently in the books. That's, yeah. again, where New Zealand looks very similar. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's the Frodo's side of and that. And then he goes all the way over here, right? Yeah, yeah the so uh, he, the gray, he right goes to the Grey Havens here, which is one of the elven cities here on the coast. And he Peace sails. Out. He sails into the west. <laughs> He's like done with this. To hopefully heal the burden of being a ring bearer. Which is there's a bunch of elves there, right? Or something. Yeah, that's where the elves all decide Originally. to go. It's essentially like their heaven. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yep. And only a few select non-elves. The earth, then. Yeah. <laughs> no. No, no. There's well, there's land over here. There is oh, land. Man. There's this way that does, or one way doesn't have something. Remember, their world has all of their religions on the same plane as the mortals. It's not like different levels. Oh. Yeah, only maybe Eru Luvatar is actually outside of gotcha. time and space, but he's still the overseeing okay. uh, force. Uh, so yeah, he sails off yeah. into the uh, um, Undying Land. And so so back to where from the, the Aragorn and Legolas and all of them, yeah. we get two diverging paths here. Where Merry and Pippin end up in Fangorn Forest, um, and they meet up with the Ents. Aragorn and Gimli and Legolas follow them in, but that is where they find the reincarnated Gandalf, who sends them on their next assignment, which he goes with them for a time. Yep. Um, Merry and Pippin stick around in Fangorn Forest until the climax of the Two Towers. Uh, Aragorn and the company go to Edoras, which is right here along the White Mountains um, down south in Rohan, and there they help get King Theoden back on his, you know, mojo, instead yep. of being possessed, uh, old and possessed. possessed by uh, his advisor, Grima Wormtongue and Saruman. Jerk. You know, next time you have a job application, don't hire a guy named Wormtongue. Yeah, probably not don't, the best don't idea. Don't do that. Bad idea. Sexy. <laughs> so once they get him back so up and running... the funny thing is, I didn't know this until I was looking over this map again... <laughs> They leave Edoras and go to Helm's Deep, which, by all means, go to a fortified position. Mm -hmm. um, but Helm's Deep is actually closer to Isengard. Yep. Which, if yeah, if you look here, Helm's Deep, it's a little bit further west. They barely traveled at all. It, they were they were just getting ready for the final battle. Yeah. It, seemed, it seemed like they were just getting ready for the final battle for like the whole last. No, no, for book. sure. And it was just interesting to me to find that out because if anything, I would think you would want to go further away. So, because it's an army of 10,000 yeah. coming your way. Yeah. So, but fortified position, whatever. No big deal. Um, that is where they make their stand against Isengard. Um, obviously, the Great Battle of Helm's Deep, fantastic scene throughout the entire movie. Yep. Um, with its climax and with Gandalf leading 
the Rohirrim that he gathered in the five days that he was not with the rest of the party. Um, they are able to break the siege there, and meanwhile, Merry and Pippin get the Ents to attack Isengard. Our heroes all regroup there at Isengard um, to tell off Saruman, um, depending on which version you see, either Saruman dies or he's just locked in his tower and Treybeard is his, you know, warden for the rest of... I prefer the one where Saruman dies because you have Me a too. great dialogue with him and uh, King Theoden. Well, also, it just it, it's a better conclusion. Yeah, especially because like all of a sudden your main bad guy from Two Towers just disappears. He's off screen. Yeah, he just locked up so, in his tower. Yeah, pretty much. Like, nope, so you can't come in. They nope. all return to Edoras for a uh, celebration. Oh, good. And then they split up once again. We can't keep the team together. Uh, Gandalf and Pippin head to Minas Tirith. Uh, Aragorn and the rest go to Dunharrow, which is somewhere south of Edoras here. Uh, he goes through the mountains at some point, gathers the army of the dead. Yep. And then, yes. and then this is where the movie kind of makes it a little odd, the way this map works. And how they end up. How they end the... up right next to the ocean or the big river that leads yeah. to Minas Tirith. Because uh, if you see here, Erch is where he gathers the army in the books, mm -hmm. which it's still, it would still be presumed that it's the same place that he gets them in the movies. Yeah, in the movie however, it just seems more coastal. However, when he comes out on the other side of the mountain, down here that doesn't make sense because we're nowhere near the ocean or the rivers. That's my only complaint about this when yeah. it comes to geography. Um, so it would be more accurate in the movies if they came out somewhere along the river here. Mm. Um, but that's where he gets the Corsair ships, and that's, you know, his whole ruse when he eventually gets to Minas Tirith and brings the Army of the Dead. Theoden, um, just, everybody just heads to the same spot at some point to break the siege of Minas Tirith. Um, they gather up their final forces and head to the Black Gate. And that is how... Final, and, final siege. The final, final battle with yep. Sauron. The awesome one. Um, yeah couple of things really quick we can just touch on Bilbo's journey in The Hobbit really fast. So he goes from the Shire, he goes all the way over to Rivendell, they go through a mountain pass that's somewhere up here, um, and that's where eventually they do, they also end up under the mountains with the goblin city that is down there. Uh, Bilbin Town. <laughs> yep. Way down in Goblin Town. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Uh, I, love, I, I, always, love that I always forget about that it's a great scene. Uh, version of the Hobbit. Yeah, well, it's a little different. Um, but so they eventually get out of the mountains. Bilbo meets Gollum, reels in the dark. He gets the ring uh, through there. Uh, the They end up in a forested area where they are cornered by the wargs and some orcs. And then uh, eagles, eagles come, come, come and save them. They get them over to Karak, which is just close to the forest of Mirkwood. And then... Gandalf leaves them at the egg entrance to the um, the forest road that leads just straight through Mirkwood over to the Lonely Mountain. Uh, shenanigans ensue. Bilbo and the dwarves fight some spiders. They have to, you know, go to the Elven King's palace because they get captured. Bilbo gets them all out by Battle throwing them in fire. barrels. And then this river right here mm. is presumably the one that they fall all the way down to Lake Town. Yes. Um, and then up to Erebor, and then we're basically in this area until the Battle of Five Armies, and then everything happens, Bilbo goes home. Yeah, so right back to the much smaller journey. Same much way. smaller journey. So you'd say Frodo had a much bigger journey. Than well, Bilbo, absolutely. Yeah, because Frodo's journey takes place over most of the con most of the continent, or whatever you want to call it. Most of the known, known stuff we Earth. care about. That ring's been on some journeys. One thing, absolutely. we never actually go northeast. Yeah, we never go to Rune. Um, the Iron Hills dwarves were the ones who came to help at, and helped and the with armies. the uh, Battle of Five Armies. And then there was a road like the Hogs or, or the, what they ride in the in the movie. Yeah, the dwarves, yeah. Hogs. Um, but like they're 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 and I I like the movie for that sense because it showed the difference in fauna and yeah, like animals. Absolutely. So it really showed so you that the, there, there are different. plenty of other stuff that they probably could have explored. Banding creatures always great. Further east. Um, and then, as we may have mentioned earlier, the Oliphant and the Haradrim and the Easterlings. So Easterlings come from this area, and then you have the Haradrim with their giant elephants down here. Uh, and then Umbar is where the Corsair ships come from 
And most of the time, those are like the Black Numenorians, which were just the bad sect of the Numenorians who eventually came to Middle Earth after the fall of Numenor. What's yep. the lake in the middle of Mordor? Uh, that is just the Sea of Nurnin. Or yeah, and any just interesting lore there? Nothing really. Nothing. Nothing of. Nothing of value. No skeletal hand with a sword. <laughs> no. Nope. No. No handing out. No lakes. Ladies handing out swords. Cool. We vote on our kings here, Alex. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, Monty Python. Sorry. Nice. Um, but mostly Gorgoroth uh, is the province where Sauron does most of his. Um, and it's the most protected area in yeah, Middle Earth. Clearly, yeah. Due to the mountain pass. That's Better. why they chose that area. Yeah, because seriously, like, area. it's it's so funny the way that this is designed because it's just this random square mountain range that just perfectly protects Sauron's domain yeah. just from any outsiders. So he's only got really two entrances he needed to worry about. Yeah. And unfortunately, hobbits are small and the steps, easy to... Yeah. That's a tough one. And then the Black Gate... Jeez. Yeah, one thing that would be interesting is, um, so with the, the prior books, remind me of the name of um, Cimmerillion. The Cimmerillion really takes place in Middle-earth as well. It doesn't never really yeah, branches and, out And that's much. the thing. Is, so Cimmerillion, uh, the landscape, from what I understand, the landscape looks a lot different, but that's just because you're talking about these giant dragons. I yeah. forget the name of the one that we mentioned. He was... But he was massive so much so giant that he black could... Dragon, right? Yes. It was like Smog times 10. Yeah. yeah. It's like yeah. giant version of like Smog. the greatest... Yeah. The greatest dragon that ever lived. something? Yeah. It? yeah. Something like that. Some no, Balerion's who you're thinking of, and that's from Game of Thrones. Dang it. But, Dang it, Game of Thrones. But either way, you were right that it's a giant black dragon. Giant so black dragon. the landscape was much different. You had the war that eventually destroyed the kingdom of Gondolin. Yeah. Um, and that just kind of changed the entire landscape, all of those... Yeah, but with Tolkien, with Tolkien no longer being alive, we're probably never going to get a no. lot of information no. about the rest. He did an amazing job of world building. Obviously, we have so much of his writings, even more so than Martin yep. at this point. But most of that has been Martin's just still kicking. Martin's still kicking. Um, but at least with Tolkien, we had his son Christopher, who uh, recently had passed away. Yep. Um, but he was going through his father's works and adapting a lot of adapting them, finishing them, doing his best to preserve that legacy and that yeah. world. Um, the Tolkien estate is very protective of the rights to it, so he was making sure that it would stay any it would stay in yeah. house. Yeah. So yeah, so so Lord of the Rings, Middle Earth, we're we're kind of done with that continent, which. Is a bummer because there's a lot to explore. Game of Thrones, though, really exciting because with the prospect of having so many shows that well, they're trying the to make. Is so with the Amazon show for Lord of the Rings, we might get some stuff. Maybe. But it'll mostly still focus on Middle that. Earth, yeah. I truly hope at some point, um, and we only talked about these two continents. I would love just like an anthology series of like Game of Thrones stuff that deals with like Sothorios or Olthos yeah. or Ashai. Just anything. I mean, just, just parts of things, like parts of the world that are just so mysterious. I would, and I don't even need the answers. I just want to see some yeah. of the things. Honestly, just the visual I don't, I don't, aspect. I don't, I don't even need amazing. to be told like, oh, well, this is why it's the Shadowlands or this is why nobody lives in Sothorios or this is what's west of Westeros. I just want to see like the process of that and honestly one of the things that disappointed me like even more so than just the ending of game of thrones was like the one thing that was interesting to me was Arya going west yeah and when they basically just said no we're, we're not we're not touching any of that we're not doing a side series with that i know it's such a I, I, I was kind of like but why not it's a missed opportunity yeah it's a missed opportunity because it would be different and i'm it not would be saying something... it needed to be like a full like seasons long thing just like have a little story about yeah. it. I don't care. Well, we'll see what we get. We'll see what so, we get. Because the glory of having is, the author still alive. Yeah, Game of Thrones has a lot of potential still, especially with two more books coming out and all these side series that are, you know. Which hopefully, active. with the books coming out, we'll get a little bit of a better conclusion. <laughs> well, now Martin knows what knows what not to do. So, <laughs> well, it's funny too because I think there was an interview where uh, he was talking about the fact that. Um, Oh, you guys didn't like the ending of, of season eight. Well, geez, you're not ready for this next book that I've got coming out, right? And there was some interview like that where it's like, oh, sh like there's gonna be some serious stuff happening. Yeah, well, he made a point of saying it branches off pretty considerably oh, from what yeah. he wanted the book to. Which, yeah, he he basically just gave them the cliff notes of 
Yeah. He, he probably just said, like, Bran becomes the king, Daenerys loses her mind, which I'm sure he will do a much better job oh, of making completely. that make sense yeah. in how it happens. Well, it felt from, like, one character on the end of one episode to, and we'll get into this on, on perspectives, yes. but, like, you know, it's like, oh, so she shifted over the course of looking at a bell and back at the city. Two episodes. Yep. The end of one and the beginning yep. of the next. It's like, huh? That's where, right. you know, Martin's got an entire book to make of yeah. how that exactly. even begins. So, um, but with that being said, um, any other last minute I think that's pretty much one covers shout about on this. No, no, nope. okay. uh, that was pretty much covered. Yeah, perfect. Okay, well, thank you for tuning in to this last filmed episode of Hows and Hobbits. Uh, from here on out, we're just going to be doing podcast form. Um, I don't know what we will be talking about next, but I am planning at least five more episodes, maybe a couple more, just depends on how we get. Um, tune in to of, find of out. this series, and then just tune into all of our other stuff. Hit that like button. Subscribe. <laughs> And, Ring that uh, notification bell. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. Peace.